Hello, welcome back to the Art Channel. My name is Grace Adam and this is my colleague Joshua White. This week we are at Oxford in the Ashmolean Museum where we're reviewing Andy Warhol works from the Hall Collection. The exhibition gives us an opportunity to see the whole of Andy Warhol's artistic career. In the show we have rarely seen films, we have early screen prints and also late celebrity portraits. Here we're looking at Brillo's soap pads box from 1964 and this is an iconic object, we all recognise it, it's been produced millions of times. Um, this one's actually painted, not mm. screen printed, the later ones were of course really mass produced. Um, it's interesting in that it's, it's, it's tatty, it's, um, it's not beautiful, but it's in our imaginations, it's, it's stayed with us. He's bringing the supermarket into the art gallery, translating the mass-produced, commonplace, functional, into something that is unique, collectible, desirable, worthy of being in an exhibition. And it's that dialogue, isn't it, mm. that really lies at the heart of Warhol's um, artistic practice. And on the box, you have so much detail. You know, with rust resistor, you've got the branded trademark yeah. sign, um, the number in the package. Um, it communicates that idea of reality, but at the same time, it's not. We mm. understand it's a copy. And whether he's uh, making a critique or not, we don't know. I think he's fascinated, appalled, seduced, as we all are, by this kind mm. of advertising. But of course, he did train uh, as a graphic artist to begin with. So he has a real uh, connection with these objects. And uh, as we know, later on, these were really mass produced by his studio. They were screen printed, mm. but this one is still hand painted. So it has a very kind of homemade feel about it. And what's quite artful is he still manages to remind us that this is appropriated, copied, it's a handmade object. You don't see any pretense at it being a box you can open up. You know, it is a pure replica. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, it asks us to sort of think about you know, what this communication actually means. Mm. And it's still, a, it's still a brand that's available. I mean, it's, it's bizarre mm. that this brand is still around. Um, and I think, as you say, Warhol's skill is to always attract us to, to the ugly and the overlooked and the mundane. We're looking at full portraits of Ethel's skull. And Ethel was a early patron of Andy Warhol and a collector with her husband of uh, pop art. Mm. And there's a nice little biographical note that they ran a taxi and limousine service. And so they used their wealth to begin supporting young artists in New York. And this um, work, because it comprises uh, four different shots, was actually made using photographs from a photo booth. We forget them now, mm -hmm. but they were used for passport photos and other uh, quick snapshots. And he then takes them back to his studio and silk screens the, uh, the photographs onto these canvases. And what you see is this wonderful kind of spontaneity and the way in which she's really embracing the medium of styling herself yeah. and posing for the camera as if she were a celebrity or movie star. Absolutely, I mean this, this system, uh, this commission works for both of them. Mm. She apparently initially is, is quite reticent about being driven downtown to a photo booth. She's expecting something much grander. But uh, Warhol takes, I think, $100 with him and, and feeds the machine. And this me mechanised way of, of making images uh, works for both of them. And she really gets into it. And so you can see her striking these poses, as you say, and really kind of um, enjoying it. Um, I think these are really strong, actually. I, re I really like these. Um, the, the images are incredibly degraded, and that's what makes them so fascinating, I think. Mm. They are somebody looking or trying to look their very best and yet Warhol takes them back to the studio and breaks down the photographic image so that they are much harder to read, much kind of dirtier images. They're quite sort of grubby. You mm. can see where the ink has carried mm. over from the screen print. It, uh, the lines are blurred. It's gritty. Um, it's messy. And I think what's so important about this early work is how it prefigures the age we live in today of social media. Mm of Instagram, of YouTube, 
Twitter and Facebook, the way in which Warhol suggested each one of us can become a star, can remake ourselves mm. in that notion of the American dream, yeah. that you have that opportunity to use the stage of life to constantly reinvent yourself. Yeah. So here we're looking at a series of uh, screenshots made between 1964 and 66, where Warhol invited visitors to the factory to come and sit in front of a camera for three minutes and do nothing, which is patently very hard to do. You see these people who are desperate for celebrity, to belong to the kind of Warhol gang, um, fidgeting in front of the camera. As we look at the films now, they've been slowed down slightly, so they have a kind of surreal quality about them. And it's nice, we're looking at Edie Sedgwick, mm. arguably Warhol's most uh, important homegrown uh, movie star. So he sets up a kind of parallel system to the Hollywood studios um, within his factory, within his studio um, in New York. And these screen tests are psychologically really interesting, mm. aren't they? Because there's that discomfort of the model subjected to scrutiny. It's, just, it's not just like a, a snapshot in a moment when a photograph is taken, but rather um, the way in which they must sit there for four minutes mm. and be looked at. What do they do in that time? All of these sitters have different responses mm. to that, and that sort of indicates something of their character. Mm. And it is a, a new take on a, on a very old way of working. They are portraits, and in that way they're old-fashioned, and, and Warhol, to some extent, um, reinvents the mm. portrait and reignites interest in the portrait. But as you say, people fidget, and over a few minutes you have time to really become aware of how you're coming over. And uh, again, a great connection with, with how we use social media now, how we portray ourselves, how we're seen. Absolutely, the way in which you can become your own music producer, your own presenter uh, in your bedroom. Yes. Um, and Warhol is the prophet of this age we're living in, whereby technologies uh, provide access mm. to a huge global audience. Um, this underground filmmaking, though, is very influential, and it's important in terms of the development of um, art films, mm. really. And you're absolutely right. They are definitely the avant-garde, but I'm mm. interested to see that he calls them screen tests. They're not tests for anything, but he is using Hollywood terminology to, to get people to come sit for the camera. And there's also a relationship of power. I mean, he's subjecting them to this prolonged gaze. But he's also asking them to perform mm. and respond to him and to the camera. This is like a vacuum for mm. them to kind of fill with their character and their physical gestures. And each one has a slightly different response to this uh, sort of um, platform, really, whereby they are being looked at. Um, I think they're really intriguing and odd and... Um, actually, uh, this exhibition provides the opportunity to see them because they're rarely shown. Mm. Um, and for that reason alone, I think it's really valuable in the context of the wider collection. Mm. Given that we can't concentrate that long, um, four minutes in front of something, is, is, it seems a real insight into somebody's personality. You can sit and watch somebody engage with the camera and with themselves over that period of time. They're, they're quite fascinating. And they're being shown, these screen tests, alongside some other films made by Andy Warhol, including sleeping figures, uh, kissing figures, and a prolonged shot over several hours of the Empire State Building, which uh, asks you to <laughs> consider when the film actually starts and ends, yeah. because nothing changes. So Grace, we're looking uh, at a silkscreen um, image uh, with acrylic paint made in 1986. It's called Christ $9.98. And it's part of a series of images that he makes in the last years of his life, black and white, um, positive and negative. We're looking at a positive version here of a sculpture, a figurine of Christ that you can find in religious shops in uh, Manhattan that would be very familiar to Warhol, the practicing Catholic. And it's an object of devotion, and you could argue it's part of a long tradition of imagery in Christian painting, uh, going back to the Renaissance and earlier. I think it, it, it operates on lots of levels, like Warhol's work does, doesn't it? Mm. It's, it's, it's deeply kitsch, you know, it's a, it's a commercially produced object, probably quite badly made. He's blown it up, so again, we're looking carefully at it. 
but you know, does it talk about his religion? Does it talk about our attitude to religion? Does it talk about the fact you can buy anything in Manhattan mm. for $10? I like the way that he's cropped the text off, so I think that says day and night and only in 998. And he gets us to focus on this pretty much life-size figure. Um, is it a religious icon or is it a, a piece of commercial tat that you can buy? But I do like the fact that he's returned to black and white, to draftsmanship, to drawing, um, really tapping into his history, his training as a graphic designer. Without the colour, you look at his drawing and maybe you get to um, think about the ideas more. Perhaps he's suggesting that you can actually find the sacred in the kitsch. Mm. Um, I mean, there is this deep ambivalence um, that lies at the heart of all of his work, but effectively he's the mirror. Um, he's looking at the world around us and quoting from it, um, bringing these uh, images and designs into the art gallery, but never letting us forget the origin, mm. the source, um, the way in which these are effectively disposable objects. Mm. But nevertheless, there's that sort of added edge to it because it's um, a, an image of Christ mm. with all of those associations and beliefs. Mm. And as you say, these images have been produced for hundreds of years uh, commercially. So in that way, it's not new. But I think you know, his, his trick is always to bring us back to the mundane, to always inspect our, our habits, our purchasing habits, our, our belief, uh, belief systems. And he, he does that with this very simple image. So this exhibition confirms that Andy Warhol is really one of the most influential artists of the late 20th century. He remains iconic. Everything has been said about him. Much has been written but fundamentally remains as an enigma. Mm. I think when you come and see a show like this, you are reminded that those issues that he's tackling are ever-present. They are still engaging and still important. And you see the work, and you still don't quite understand what he's trying mm. to tell you. And that's fascinating. On the face of it, they're very straightforward. But actually, as you go through the decades, you can see him tackling the same ideas over and over and trying to get to grips with them. And I think we're still trying to get to grips with him. Thank you for watching the Art Channel. Please do come back for further reviews of contemporary art. And if you want to subscribe, you can press the red button on the screen.